uh, thank you for joining us at the Sankalp Global Summit 2021. On behalf of Sankalp Bio Foundations and Bio AG, I welcome you all to this very important session on health for all, hunger for none. All of us have experienced for the past 18, 19 months, the impact of the pandemic. And uh, you know, either it is with health or it is to do with nutrition, I don't think anybody has been left unscathed. According to the UN, an additional 70 to 161 million people are likely to have experienced hunger because of COVID. 90% of the countries are still reporting one or more disruptions to essential health services. In the context of this, this particular session gains a lot of importance. And I'm very pleased to kickstart this panel discussion with a keynote address by Urvashi Prasad, a public health and policy expert with the Niti Aayog. Ms. Prasad will provide an overview of the state of public health in the country. A little brief about Ms. Prasad. Ms. Prasad comes with an extensive experience in health, nutrition, sanitation, gender, and public policy. For over five years, she has worked as a public policy specialist in the office of the vice chairman at Niti Aayog. And she's also been at the core team supporting the SDGs uh, and uh, also looking at the task, member of the task force for overseeing the implementation of the SDGs. A prolific speaker, writer, she has co-authored India's first voluntary national review presented at the United Nations High Level Political Forum on Sustainable Development in 2019. Urvashi has had an illustrious journey with the Susan and Bell Foundation and was also the director of Operation Asha, one of India's largest tuberculosis control NGOs. Over to you, Urvashi. Hi, am I audible? Yes, sir. because I have a poor network bandwidth where I am. So if I'm not audible, I'll keep my video off. We can hear you. Please go ahead. Welcome. Okay. Okay. So, uh, yes. Yeah. Uh, uh, this is, you know, obviously a very, very important topic for us uh, right now. Uh, you mentioned the statistics up front, uh, which are obviously very, very uh, concerning uh, for not just one country, but for, for all of us. And I, I think that's one thing the pandemic has shown is that we have tremendous interdependence. Um, you know, one, uh, one economy is really not separate from the other. Uh, we're all in this together uh, and the, even the adverse impact impact of the pandemic has affected all of us uh, perhaps to different degrees to different extents but uh, we are all impacted by this so i think that is one uh, very very important um, lesson that we have taken away from this pandemic um, but i think coming to india um, in terms of the public health situation here um, i think you know in the immediate priority, of course, has been very much related to uh, mitigating the impact of this pandemic, to ramping up our vaccination coverage, etc. But I think the the uh, medium to longer term plan for us is to actually build a robust and a resilient public health system, um, and that is that is really a massive, massive task in a country uh, as large and as diverse as ours. Um, because you know we don't just have the central government; we have state governments. We have sub-state governments, uh, we have the private sector, we have civil society. So we have so many different stakeholders that need to come together um, and, and really help us build this resilient health system. So I think that is one of the most important shifts for us um, is to move from curative uh, health care or rather prioritizing curative health care uh, to prioritizing public health, uh, preventive health, uh, to to promoting wellness. Uh, this is a very, very fundamental shift that we are trying to make, uh, even at the policy level. So, of course, we will always need curative care. We will always need hospitals and doctors and specialists. Uh, but how do we actually try and focus much more on prevention, on early detection uh, of diseases? This is especially relevant when we talk of the non-communicable diseases. Uh, and India is now facing an increasing burden of non-communicable diseases. Uh, plus, we have the threats related to climate change, 
um, which are which are also creating a lot of uncertainty. Uh, we have pandemics like this, which might come up in the future. Unfortunately, this might not be the last uh, pandemic that we actually uh, have to experience. So how do we make our system much more resilient, uh, focus much more on prevention, on health promotion, on wellness, and nutrition, of course, has a very, very big role to play there, uh, whether it's nutrition, whether it's access to clean drinking water or sanitation. Uh, these are all very, very critical determinants of good health. Uh, so what we are trying to, the policy shift we're trying to make is rather than looking at these in silos, uh, rather than looking at health separately and nutrition separately and sanitation separately, uh, gender you know, we often we often sort of look at it as a separate area altogether, but actually it is so cross-cutting uh, and it cuts across all these sectors and is crucial um, for progress in all these sectors. So we are trying to now build a much more of a multi-sectoral collaborative approach um, in which it's not just the government, but equally the private sector, the entrepreneurs, the startups, um, civil society, they all have a very crucial role to play. Uh, and we've seen that in the pandemic, uh, that uh, we would certainly not have been able to respond to such a massive emergency uh, if we did not have this sort of multi-sectoral collaboration. Uh, so I think, you know, the role of each of these stakeholders becomes very, very crucial. Um, technology is, is, is really one aspect that stands out. Um, when I talk of, you know, private sector or entrepreneurship, um, we, this is definitely going to be an era of technology, uh, the post-COVID era. The challenge for us is how do we make sure that access to these technologies is equitable? Uh, in the Indian context, this becomes one of the most challenging us. Um, if we look at telemedicine, we've been able to ramp up telemedicine considerably in our urban centers, in our cities during the pandemic. But how do we take this to our rural and remote areas? Um, how do we integrate it with our health system in those areas? That is really the challenge that lies ahead for us. Um, because technology, as much as it is a great enabler, uh, it can also end up creating a lot of divides uh, if we have unequal access to technology. So I think there uh, are our entrepreneurs, our private sector, um, people who are doing these innovations, our startups, uh, they can really work alongside the government uh, to come up with uh, not just technology innovations uh, for the sake of it, but ultimately technology innovations which help us to reach uh, even the most remote and rural areas, reach the poorest, reach the last mile, as we call it. Um, I think that is where that innovation can play a very, very critical role because government per se has those networks, it has that scale, uh, but it needs the expertise, the know-how, the innovation uh, of our entrepreneurs, um, our startups, our private sector to uh, work in partnership and be able to take these technologies across the country. So I think that is one very, very big area that stands out and we're trying to do a lot of initiatives on the policy side as well, um, specifically when it comes to how do we use uh, technology. But I think the other aspect is really, as I said, that you know, on policy, we are trying to make this shift. Um, again, we need uh, partners in this journey how do we shift the attention of the population to to wellness, uh, to tracking their personal health and well-being, uh, to to acting um, very much in time, you know, rather than waiting for for an illness to happen or waiting for somebody to sick fall sick and then we react uh, and go to a hospital, which is how much of our health system has been oriented so far. Uh, how do we actually encourage people to be more proactive and to take charge of their health and to take charge of their well-being? Um, and how do we get this message across in a creative manner? Um, again, there's a lot of innovations here. We are seeing a lot of right from wearables to, to smart sensors, to you know, use of technology uh, in all sorts of innovative ways. But really the question from the policy side um, and from the government side, and I think for all of us, uh, is how do we take all of this to the last mile? How do we take all of this to our rural, remote, tribal, areas and make sure that these things don't get limited to just our urban centers or just our uh, metro cities. So, so I think there's, there's a lot of scope uh, for us to work collaboratively. The challenge is massive, uh, not just the immediate challenge coming out of the pandemic, uh, but also the more longer term repercussions of it. Uh, women have suffered disproportionately in many ways, even when it comes to the health and nutrition indicators. We have a lot of evidence uh, which is coming to the fore to this effect. So how we really plan for the future uh, to learn from this pandemic, to use the opportunities 
uh, and eventually build a much more resilient uh, system which can which can combat uh, a threat and emergency like this in the future much better i think that is really where we where we need to move towards um, so so i'll stop here and and i think this is a fantastic session which is planned um, and, and i really look forward to uh, the discussions that will happen today thank you Thank you. Thank you so much, Agarshi. I'm picking up a couple of words that you spoke, you know, especially on prioritizing wellness. I remember many years back, uh, Malcolm X said that if you were to interchange I with V, even illness becomes wellness. Yeah, so I think it, it resonates very strongly at the emphasis that we are now putting on uh, wellness and the way we are looking at preventive uh, health care. I've, you know, I've been listening to the sessions in Sankalp since yesterday, and this approach of multi-sectoral collaborative approach where we are looking at investors, not-for-profits, corporates, funders, everybody coming together is a theme that is running across. And I'm very glad that you uh, brought this up. And I think, you know, the deliberations that are going to now happen will also be focusing more on all these and what is the way forward for us to bring in social innovation in all of these projects that could take healthcare at a different level. Thank you very much for joining us and for sharing your views with us. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm pleased to now invite you to join us for the panel discussion. Joining me are Dr. Peng Dong from the Bayer Foundation, Andrea, who heads corporate giving at Bayer AG, Dr. Francois Bonisi from the Schwab Foundation, and Abby, who's the CEO of Advantage Health Africa. As you can see, they all come from different corners of the world and are happy to share with you the wealth of knowledge that they bring with them. I now hand over to Dr. Lina Suni, an economist specializing in social entrepreneurship who is moderating this session. Lina, over to you. Thank you very much, Sarita, and uh, welcome everyone to this uh, really exciting uh, panel session on gender, nutrition, health, and of course, the side serving of social entrepreneurship and social innovation. Um, it's fantastic to have this panel um, with us that spans the whole globe, essentially, from um, the eastern side of Asia via Africa, um, Europe, and over to Brazil. So this is fantastic. Um, as we heard from the, from the uh, uh, keynote speaker of this session, um, women are of course disproportionately affected by uh, access, poor, in terms of poor access to health care services, um, poor access to nutritious food, poor access to water. Um, but we also know that women and female empowerment plays a huge role in terms of um, enabling uh, good food, good health access for the whole family. Um, women are the primary caregivers, so um, e e enabling women's empowerment and agency, of course, improves um, health care output, um, outcomes for the whole household, um, and especially for children. Um, so we want to start this session by um, asking Pang, what what is it that Bayer Foundation has been doing in terms of you know gender and nutrition and health, and how do you see your role here in in bringing in social innovation to um, combat some of the challenges we see here in in better access to nutritious food and better health access? Thank you, Lina, for that question. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everyone. Uh, I'm Peng from Bayer Foundation. Um, thanks a lot also for a Sankal uh, Global Summit to inviting me to the panel. I'm looking forward also to the discussion later. I think, Lina, to your question, uh, maybe a little bit introduction of what uh, Bayer Foundation actually does would be helpful. So for this, I would like to share two slides briefly about um, what uh, our scope of work is. If you can just let me know if you're able to see the slide quickly and I can continue. Yes. Perfect. So um, as you know, Bayer Foundation um, is a Bayer's corporate foundation with a long history over 100 years. Uh, it's also a philanthropic uh, donor and a German legal entity. So we promote advances in science and on the other side, social innovation um, for a world with uh, health for all and hunger for none. So we believe that science on one side is a basis for societal progress and the other side, social innovation as a 
uh, enabler for long lasting change. So the underlying theme of these two parts seems to be far, but the underlying theme is the innovation connecting uh, both dots. Um, and uh, our work of supporting uh, social entrepreneurs, you can see in the next slide for our supporting programs, it covers all stages of innovation, um, starting from early stage that explores an idea and basic elements of a business model uh, to incubate stage where innovation solutions have already taken shape, um, have some initial evidence, but are still open for experimentation, all the way to the uh, scale stage where mature solutions have been tested with a solid business model, either through its own mechanism or through external co-fundings. So, and our focus area is um, geographically is also Sub-Saharan Africa, one of the world's uh, most vulnerable parts. And we identify social entrepreneurs as a key to identify and scale um, inclusive business models. And this makes innovation more sustainable in the long run. Um, I think as many of other philanthropic donors, uh, our role of Bio Foundation supporting social entrepreneurs lies mainly on two folds. First of all, um, it's funding, right? Our funding focuses more on long-term impact rather than short-term and mid-term return on investment financially. And this also means that we're more open and tolerant for uh, failure and pivoting of directions. With that innovation mindset at foundation, we're trying to do more experimentation and testing with our partners and co-create solutions together. And second of all, I think this stakeholder group that we often reach um, our government authorities and also policymakers. Um, and this is not the usual stakeholder groups that social entrepreneurs um, focus, at least to start with. They focus a lot more on um, market, on the users and trying to solve the problem within the market. This is important, but it's not enough. Like Professor Prasad just said, you, know, you need a government, you need policymakers in order to implement and scale those solutions to, to reach the last mile. So I think for this aspect, our Bio Foundation also put a lot of effort getting connected with policymakers and authorities. And we think uh, we can help the social entrepreneurs with this uh, complementary uh, value. So I hope this answers uh, some of the questions. Lina. Thank you very much. That's really interesting. Um, I want to now dig a little bit deeper. When we're talking about you know, creating um, nutrition and health access for all, um, what are the, some, some of the challenges involved in that? And I wanted to turn to um, Francois, who, you know, both considering your, um, you know, previous hat as a, as a medical doctor and, and your current hat as, as um, you know, in terms of um, social entrepreneurship and managing a social entrepreneurship program, um, what are some of the key challenges um, in reaching the most marginalized groups uh, when it comes to improving nutrition and health? And uh, of course, what is the role of some, what is the role that social entrepreneurs can bring here in bringing innovation or simply bringing better access? Yeah, thanks so much, Lena. Delighted to be here um, at Suncalp again, but virtually. So um, it's it's a really important moment, and COVID has shown, I think, the you know what's always been there, but has just made it extremely visible and uh, increasingly of concern that uh, marginalized groups, whether they be marginalized because of gender, because of age, because of location, geography, um, because of history, uh, that um, have always borne the brunt of poor health access, poor nutrition. And that's, you know, just, and there's clear data to show how those groups have been disproportionately affected by, by COVID, particularly around health and nutrition, as you mentioned, and, you know, all, all the impacts of, of the, the economic uh, fallout that we've had. And even increasingly, as the world gets to kind of restart in many ways and economies are restarting, that's clearly leaving people out. So you know, the, the, the extremes are, are getting worse. The, the role, I think, of social entrepreneurs is... Is shifting, which I think is a really exciting time, as I think you and, and uh, our guest speaker shared um, the recognition of the role they played. I think, you know, so I've been thinking about and working with social innovation um, in the context of public health systems for two decades and recognize that at, you know, 10 years ago, 15 years ago, it was social entrepreneurs were working to provide health services, um, you know, nutrition support. 
uh, whatever it be across the, the the spectrum but it in spite of government and in spite of you know in in the places where markets failed and governments were were, were not able to reach uh, and and that was important because it filled gaps but it often worked in isolation and often were some of the barriers towards them scaling their work uh, and so i think you know a recognition the the critical role these actors play um, in not only filling the gaps, but in actually being part of health systems and being part of food systems is really the recognition that I think we're starting to think about. And therefore it is, you know, our collective responsibility to create a system that not only enables them to scale, but actually recognizes how we work uh, together as a collective to deliver health to deliver nutrition, et cetera. So they've played a critical role. You know, one example, um, Mothers to Mothers, which probably is relatively well known, uh, you know, is across uh, 10 African countries now, but how it really, you know, it brings together many of the things we spoke about, you know, initially started around the role of um, mothers who had been through an HIV diagnosis, a pregnancy, uh, and, and the birth of their child, and almost regardless of the outcome, had become mentors for uh, newly diagnosed HIV positive mothers. And, you know, and so it started in this realm, and I was a doctor at the time, you know, and I remember maybe had five to six minutes per patient in overwhelmed public hospitals, giving someone an HIV positive diagnosis. And, you know, the majority of that were healthy young women of reproductive age. Um, and and th there was no ways to really deal with the the, the 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 full picture of what that required you know the 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 the, the peer support the counseling support the health support the family support uh, and recognizing not to mention you know all the other barriers they faced around economic geography etc and so what what seemed like okay you know here is a uh, a, a, a group of, of people who might be able to help this problem actually became an integral part of health systems. And the way that mother, Mothers to Mothers designed that was to, to change the mindset of professionals like myself who were doctors in systems to say that actually uh, patients are not only advocates, but actually uh, citizens and community members can actually be health workers and can be uh, become part of and resourced not only as volunteers or as community health workers that are not paid or poorly paid, but actually uh, to be a real part of the health system and recognizing how much other expertise they brought to a holistic view of health. Um, and, and during COVID, those trusted relationships in a time where information uh, asymmetry uh, and is there at a time where, um, you know, we retreated into our, our institutions where actually we needed to be reaching out uh, was a really important role and, and particularly for um for, for for women and so i think that's just a maybe i won't go on too long but just to, to show how it's not only during COVID. i think it's because of this long-term role that social entrepreneurs have had and the trust that they've had with communities that has we've recognized how important that is during this period so maybe i'll pause there and you might have other questions thank you um super interesting and since we're talking about entrepreneurs let's move uh to an entrepreneur um, Abby, I would love to um, hear more from you about, you know, what do you see as the role in, of startups here in, in enabling better access uh, across health and nutrition and you know, perhaps also talk about your own choice of uh, starting a startup in order to um, you know, have a, a health and nutrition impact. Okay, health and nutrition, it's a huge, huge space and it's got, it's fraught with so many challenges and gaps. I think the unique perspective that entrepreneurs bring is that we are able to see challenges or issues or problems as opportunities. Where those, you know, those bulldogs that just don't give up on issues. And we come with a combination of experience and tenacity and insight into problem solving. I'll give you an example with what we do at Advantage Health Africa. We have identified gaps in the you know, provision of medication at the last mile. And we created a solution for direct to consumer where you take medicines from licensed pharmacies and then deliver to individuals at home in the offices, or even if there were, you know, patients in the hospital and the hospital has run out of inventory. 
that, that service at the last mile is such that we are able to meet a gap in access to genuine medicines. Same way with nutrition, same way with you know, finding solutions at either the last mile, middle or you know, mid chain or up, upstream in the value chain. Um, my, as an entrepreneur, I have, I'm bringing the, you know, my, my experience working in corporate entities, my experience you know, working in a philanthropic organization, and now my experience in running a startup. All of, all of those you know, um, you know, are deep experiences that help to solve the problem even better than just coming with one perspective. Um, entrepreneurs, I think, you know, are able to bootstrap and you know, we're, we're, we're just a resilient bunch, if, if you say so. And as a female entrepreneur, I come with you know, that nurturing ability that comes natural to women who bring that perspective of, you know, look, food, healthcare, family, shelter, you know, being able to educate our children, those are things that we're normally concerned about as females. And so as an, a female entrepreneur operating in healthcare, I think it's a, it's a great combination. Let me not hold the mic for too long. Great, thank you. Um, so one question I have, so there's this tendency to focus a lot about te on tech specifically. Um, when I teach entrepreneurship, social entrepreneurship here in India, I normally talk about the issues around toilets and just focusing on putting toilets everywhere, not really thinking about the social, cultural, behavioral aspects of making sure that a technology is received and, and used and, and fits the local context. Um, what is your experience there in, in, you know, in a, making sure that as we scale tech and we try to get it, especially to marginalized communities, how do we make sure that, how do we do, deal with some of the challenges related to you know, technology and getting that across to everyone? Not only enabling equal access, but enabling the kind of technology that suits people across different levels and different kinds of yeah. know-how, et cetera, and different contexts. Okay, so my perspective and actually my experience is that tech in itself is simply an enabler. Whether it's simple, low tech, as simple as SMS or USSD or even WhatsApp using a messaging app, or as high tech as using AI and all sorts of things regarding machine learning, it's an enabler. The first thing is trust. Do the people trust that what you're bringing to them has considered their perspective? So many of us do the work of tech first before we come to do the understanding of the receiver, the user, or the intermediary, the providers. Sometimes we put in place tech and it cannot integrate with the pharmacies or the clinics or the laboratories. We don't understand their own context and realities. So there's that bit of work that helps to build trust, such that when you even introduce tech that doesn't deliver everything at the same time, they can walk the journey with us. And then, you know, when they do that, we have better success. Too much investment in tech with, to the negligence of actual human, I mean, human acceptance and, you know, building trust is a no-no. I think that um, we should do much more in building trust and coming up with simple prototypes that are riding on that level of trust and acceptance before we then invest too much in you know, tech. Tech is great. It's an enabler. It's not the be all and it's not an end in itself. No, I think that makes me want to sort of take back the conversation to you know the system levels we talked about a little bit before and that we need to have the right kind of support for enabling the right kind of support for entrepreneurs, um, uh, but also think about different kinds of perspectives in the systems to make sure that actors work together and that we can really, um, you know, create better access. And I think here, not only better access, but better improve the, the, the uh, technologies so that it suits everyone. Um, I wanted to actually go back to Francois before I come over to Andrea again. And, you know, since you've been talking about, um, you know, creating better systems, how do you see better support, not only for you know, individual entrepreneurs, but how do we build um, an innovation space or uh, you know, an entrepreneurship focus that enables solutions that are actually compat compatible with local, um, co again, local contexts or what people actually need? Thanks, uh, Lena. And um, we'll let, we could spend days on this topic because it's one that I'm really, really, uh, you know, I'm interested in because 
I think we, we need to move from only thinking about scaling individual solutions and even building systems to just scale individual solutions to actually thinking about what we want to achieve and how we create kind of healthy uh, ecosystems for all the different actors to actually play their part. And so I, I, I've, you know, I've been around long enough to, to see that some of the challenges with the scale thinking. Um, and so um, on, on one hand, I think we've spoken and we've seen here the role of different actors coming together. I think we, we didn't emphasize and it was amazing to have uh, our guest speaker to actually have the role of governments. I mean, I think it is really critical, particularly in, in, in many countries where uh, the public health system is actually where uh, people who don't have the resources and the means you know, fall back on uh, in, in both um, finding whether it's uh, uh, you know, the health services or access to you know, welfare, whatever it might be uh, in, in those gaps. So I, I, you know, I don't think we speak enough or we really engage government enough in, in developing those systems that we think, you know, as the private, you know, that this is, this is all about entrepreneurship and startups and this is a private approach. Uh, I, I worry that that may not get us because that we're entirely reliant on, on market mechanisms. So the, mar the market is really important, uh, but that to be rec regulated, incentivized, stimulated uh, and shaped together with government uh, where possible I think is a, is really important kind of point for us to make and, and to and to think about and I think there's an opening now right and I think ministries of health and um, uh, and and those you know of trade as well are thinking about well what is the role that social entrepreneurs can play in in our goals which are around you know full inclusion and access to, to, to services and good nutrition. So I think that's the first point. I think um, obviously a lot of the multi-stakeholder partnerships, coalition buildings that we've seen around this time are important. You know, San Calpe is, is a partner of ours in the COVID Response Alliance for Social Entrepreneurs that we host at the World Economic Forum. Um, and that's been helpful just for a bit of coordination. Uh, so, okay, well, who's doing what bit and what are we trying to move forward? Um, and, and then giving, I guess, social entrepreneurs, you know, a seat at the table when we're having these discussions is, is important as well. So always, you know, so, you know, even on the panel, um, having, having the entrepreneurs here, I think is really important. Finally, my last take is that systems work, and I've just published a book called Systems Work, the systems work of social change is not only about large macro systems and policies and large frameworks, but actually is the work, the deep work, uh, that is about participation, that is about inclusion, is about the creation of agency, it's about uh, really allowing uh, and, and changing what kind of for me social purpose organizations, social enterprises are about, which isn't only about the delivery of goods and services and products, but is actually about um, empowerment of individuals, citizens, communities to actually self-determine their own future, what they might want, what their needs really are, and to be part of designing systems to, to deliver that. Wonderful. Um, I think we should, uh, since you mentioned your book, systems, The Systems Work of Social Change, How to Harness Connection, Context, and Power to Cultivate Deep and Enduring Change. Go and buy it, people. Uh, and let's have a even more panels on, uh, on, on systems thinking next year. Um, Thank you so much. Since you said uh, it's not only about corporates, I think this is the time to then speak to Andrea about the role of corporate. I mean, how do you, um, and I have a couple of questions here that I'm sort of combining into one. One is around the work that you obviously do um, in scaling tech and innovation for health, um, health and nutrition, especially then focusing on gender. Um, but also, um, in last, just the last two, three years, we've seen a shift from social entrepreneurship, at least slightly more, less mainstream to um, a lot more corporates thinking at their core about social innovation, about social impact and how their business focus, um, impacts, um, you know, development or social aspects. How have you, you worked uh, to sort of, I don't know if you call it mainstreaming, but bringing social impact aspects into the core of your business and not just having, a, as, as I say, a CSR uh, or a philanthropic uh, department? Oh, thank you for the question, Lina. First of all, I feel really, really privileged to be in such a diverse perspective discussion. I think this is what we really need. Um, and then to bring a bit about the um, corporate perspective here, um, your question is excellent to the point that we as a, as a company 
we have decided to pursue this vision of uh, a world with health for all and hunger for none. And within health for all, uh, one of the aspects that we privilege, so there are specific areas of health, but one of the, the ones we think is more powerful is really women's health and contraception. And the reason for that is because we truly believe this is a key factor for development and equity. So uh, coming to Francois's point and to people having the power to decide their futures, what they want to pursue, what they want to do with their lives, contraception ex access to family planning is a key aspect for every woman and girl in the world. So, um, and we see still uh, the, the data from WHO between 12, 2015 and 20, 2019, about half of the pregnancies in the world are unplanned still. And if you look into the poorest regions of the world, the chances that women have an unplanned pregnancy is about three times greater than in the wealthiest parts of the world. So there's definitely here room uh, and the need for an intervention and, and to corporates and, and nonprofits and the, the government to cooperate, to make and accelerate this access. Uh, with COVID, uh, we have seen from data from the United Nations Population Fund that in one year of pandemic, around 14, 12 million of women have had some kind of interruption into their family planning uh, resources or methods. And that has resulted so far in more than 1.4 million pregnancies and planned on top of, of the problems that we already had before. So more than ever in this specific example of, of the area of contraception, there is need really for innovation and for, or for partnering. So at Bayer, we have set up this goal for us, uh, which is um, offering access to health care, to, to family planning options, to modern contraception, to 100 million women by 2030. And to do that, there are many ways, but I would say there are two main pillars, which is access to products. And that is uh, what is related to supply chain and to less mile delivery and so on. But there's also the part of strengthening uh, the healthcare systems in the countries. And to do that, um, as, as it was already discussed here, it's not something that you do on behalf of governments, but you do together with governments. Um, and COVID itself brought some, some I think bro broke some paradigms to the point that um, telemedicine, for example, is an option to reach people when you cannot really go to the doctor or in regions that are so remote that option to going to a doctor is not an option. Um, and last mile delivery and so on, and even access to information, because we know that a big part of the challenges in contraception has to do with access to information itself. And that needs to be tailored to each culture, uh, to your point, Nina, about uh, taking into account the cultural and, and um, let's say human aspect behind all, the, all that you offer. Um, so we see that to that point, um, Partnering up with social entrepreneurs is, is instrumental really to bring new ideas and to bring new technologies, but not only technologies, but new approaches uh, to tackle this problem. And we can be as a corporate supporting entrepreneurs and focusing on, on this kind of initiatives. We can, I, I believe we can actually spark or be a crystal in, in the crystallization of models that can be later on replicated or adopted by governments. Um, as examples, we have been reaching populations in very rural and remote areas of Mexico, for example, with education and contraception um, through remote uh, trainings, or we are now looking into projects in the Amazon where you can really bring basic healthcare advice to women uh, through telemedicine, which wasn't thinkable, thinkable before. And that only by partnering with, with such new approaches and new ideas that you can then show a model, prove a model, and then um, most likely have governments approaching and um, uh, further scaling out those models. So to your question, the traditional CSR approach is uh, more and more giving space to this innovative um, kind of initiatives and to support entrepreneurs give light, shine light into their ideas and allow them to scale to proof concept. Of course, this goes along with taking risk, which is something that we think is uh, necessary and mandatory if you really want to, to bring innovation into those, those topics. Um, and I think really it's not about uh, one corporate supporting an idea. I really truly believe in the ecosystem approach. We should really be working together even with other corporates and really accelerate what we can uh, because that's how you bring about, about uh, uh, impact in a faster uh, pace, I would say. And I don't think we have much time left uh, to really tackle problems. I'm just mentioning 
family planning and contraception, but if you look into climate um, uh, challenges and hunger and access to, to, to food security, we need to work together. So um, I totally support the, the ecosystem approach and I think corporates need to rethink um, their CSR as we are trying to do at Bayer. And I think this is a very good path we're, we're heading to. Thank you, super interesting. And um, you know, as, as you mentioned, um, you know, a focus on, on gender again, and it, it's something that's obviously coming through our whole conversation. Um, as, and I mentioned um, at the start of this panel that we know studies have shown that uh, women are disproportionately affected by nutrition and health, but also are the, the, the sort of key to improving um, nutrition levels within the families as primary caregivers. And of course, uh, certainly primary caregivers of, of the children under, under five who tend to also be uh, where, where good nutrition is particularly important. Um, so then the question comes, is there a, a particular role for female entrepreneurs here? When we're looking at issues that are disproportionately affecting women, um, do female, does female entrepreneurship um, have a particular role to play? And I actually wanted all of you to answer this, but I think I'll start with Abby as, as the uh, entrepreneur in residence on this panel. Abby, you're on mute. I don't know if you are. Then I'll move on to Andrea, back to Andrea. So if you could start and then I'll ask the rest of you. Sure, sure. and I would actually refer to Abby's uh, words when she talks about the nurturing uh, aspect that only women can bring to, I mean, set the sensitivity of, of, uh, of uh, capturing the challenges and the way to tackle it. I think women bring so much to that, to that um, perspective. And I think Abby has, is the perfect example there. Um, of how you can really bring together the, the skills, the hard skills, the experience, um, the business mindset, but also the women um, nurturing aspect to, to that equation. And um, I can think about many examples we support at Bayer. We have a program in China, which is uh, enabling women um, to um, better educate uh, their families and communities on nutrition aspects. And, and I think this is basically what uh, you need really to have women as the as the replicators and and having women uh, bringing this um, this uh, perspective of mothers of uh, family uh, caregivers uh, to a bigger community. And I think Abby, maybe you can add on to to your experience uh, with much more property than I can, being an entrepreneur yourself. Okay, so for for me, women seem to you know go over the top with things like this. Where you know we're very concerned about you know the the foundation being the children. In fact, we have an African proverb. I'm not sure if it's an African proverb, but I relate it to Africa, saying it takes a village to raise a child. And I add the qualifier: it takes a village to raise a good child. And really, it's the women. It's the woman that says, "Oh, your son was climbing a tree yesterday. You know, we don't talk to him." And you wonder what's hers because she can see from one another perspective. Women bring a multi-perspective, multifaceted, you know, input into addressing these global issues. And I really think that a woman that is then empowered with all the necessary resources, networks and support to handle nutrition, healthcare issues, I think is one that will give above and beyond. I'm not saying the men are not adequate. I'm simply saying that we bring more to the table. Understanding technology as an enabler is not, you know, is not gender specific. A woman can bring an understanding of coding or use of technology, so it shouldn't be a limitation. And uh, we've seen uh, we've seen women, you know, step out from you know the mid-level career to take on more entrepreneurial roles because they've seen that they can tackle them. We just need to encourage more and more women to do this. I hope that helps with the conversation. Thank you, Abby. Um, Peng, I don't know if you want to um, share a few thoughts on this. 
Yes, I think uh, supporting um, female entrepreneurs is a very, very important topic uh, to the Bayer Foundation. And we support female entrepreneurs um, through our signature program called Women Empowerment Award. It's also a new program we started off this year. And why we do this um, is because, I mean, female entrepreneurs just having so many challenges before COVID and post COVID. And even back in 2018, the World Bank statistics have already shown that female-led enterprises in Africa has like six times lower capital access compared to the, the, ma the male-owned um, enterprise. You know, and then I don't recall the number after COVID, but I can only imagine it's getting worse. And, and access, you know, lack of access to capital is only one of the so many challenges that the female entrepreneurs are facing. And that's why we, we thought about you know, this year to start off this, uh, this awards, uh, trying to support the female entrepreneurs as, as much as we can. Um, it's by a combination approach. Uh, one side, it has an emotional role model inspiration to the public, which we also think is very important. And the other side is the, the real solid support into driving uh, their innovation not only a cash prize we offer, but also um, the accelerator program, which combines strengthening their own business models, as well as uh, getting connected with more external stakeholders. Um, so for example, Abby is one of our award winners and we really enjoy the process, you know, how to uh, identify and also grow together with our award winners um, and, and seeing them getting more connected with other investors and, and could gain in general, more public visibilities. This is really rewarding. And uh, thank you very much for being together with us on this journey. Yeah. Great, thank you, Fang. Um, obviously, uh, we'd also love to hear from Francois who um, represents the other gender on this panel. So we're being inclusive. Uh, don't feel like you're put on the spot here by also asking whether female entrepreneurs play an outsized role. Um, but also, you know, more seriously, um, is it something you have, you know, at the Schwab Foundation, is it something you have in, looked at in particular as, as, as an important approach or, um, you know, how are you thinking about um, the role of gender of the entrepreneur in relation to matters that are very significant, significant for one gender or the other? Yeah, good start. I mean, it, it's very important, first of all, to say that. And I'm glad that I, I you know, the, the first start is that, you know, uh, we all listen and learn from uh, women who actually are doing this themselves. And we've certainly seen and listened and learned during, particularly during the pandemic, how, again, outsiders as female founders and female leaders of organizations, how, again, the impact has, you know, been tremendous on them and seen, you know, drop out in participation in external fora where they're kind of needing to be reaching out because of all the additional pressures they face over and above male entrepreneurs. I mean, just some clear um, um, uh, additional sets of barriers uh, that COVID has brought along with the ones that are existing. And then, of course, you know, women of color, even more so, and there's plenty of data to show kind of the, the flow of funding just, you know, just even even just on that measure so uh, it's about intentionality like all um, um, aspects of exclusion uh, the only way to really address it is with intentionality and uh, by looking at all of the dimensions of it so I think by you know having it you know on the agenda and having you know specific awards and funds I think are all part of that intentionality um, but again it goes down to um, you know the, the does it have an outsized impact? I mean, I think the, the women uh, social entrepreneurs who, and we obviously look at uh, the Shrub Foundation really has very well established social entrepreneurs. So our community is, is, is very well established. Look at those that have really helped to shape the field, but also talking about kind of what, what leadership looks like today. And I think a lot of the lessons are coming if you go back of what actually women social entrepreneurs and women entrepreneurs have actually been doing in their organizations, in their companies for quite some time. So whether it be the body shop or people tree or, uh, you know, child and youth finance, um, uh, child line, you know, all of these amazing organizations that were led by women uh, social entrepreneurs, they were, you know, when, once you start to unpack actually what was happening in their style of leadership and what that led to and the kind of work that the, those organizations have done over a long time may not always have been the most flashy or big scale 
kind of uh, work, but there's something much deeper going on that is about longer transformative change. And, you know, Abby spoke about the nurturing aspects and it's not those stereotypes, but there's something that's actually brought into management and leadership and how organizations are developed. So, I mean, that's mostly anecdotal, but I, 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 I do think that, that the way forward is about intentionality and about, um, of course, uh, putting the agenda in the hands of women themselves and having, you know, all of us be part of, the, of of developing that. I mean, I come from a family of a very uh, um, amazing mother and sister, and so you know, I've, I've, you know, I'm the runt of the family. So uh, it, it's uh, something that I certainly will continue to to be supportive of. And the fact that you know our chairperson and our board is majority women has always, you know, for us driven made that quite explicit in in, in our work. And um, I think in the world of the World Economic Forum, which is a representation of leadership of existing business and government that's still a reflection of how male dominated the world is um, bringing women social entrepreneurs alongside them um, as an alternative form of leader not only because of their gender but because particularly of the work that they do I think is a powerful statement you're on mute, yeah, I'll, yeah. Uh, sorry uh, rookie mistake I'll um, um, again Francois I wanted to ask you and then turn to a couple of the others uh, on the panel um, in terms of support, are we seeing, uh, you know, both at global fora like the World Economic Forum and, um, but also um, nationally, do we see an increased support or at least a recognition that we need more support for female entrepreneurs, whether it's, um, you know, venture capital funding or um, even evaluation of companies in a way, prospective uh, investees in a way that are more appropriate uh, for female headed um, companies, for example, do we see a shift in focus, not just say, oh, I'll, I'll set up a gender first fund, but do we see a shift in understanding that we need perhaps adjust uh, ways to support female entrepreneurs? Is that something you're seeing either at the global conversation or even nationally at what, what different investors, incubators do? Yeah, I'll, I'll be quick. I mean, yes, but nowhere near enough. I think it's been coming pre-COVID. I think COVID really helped to, again, bring the gender dimension to the fore. Um, but uh, there's still lots for us to learn and do. So I mean, I, I don't think we're anywhere near the scale of, of what it could be, but I think there's definitely a, uh, you know, an increased understanding uh, and, and a willingness to, to learn about what kinds of approaches we need to take. So I'll, I'll leave it there so others can jump in. Pang, uh, do, you, um, do you have, you know, what are you looking to do in terms of um, you know, supporting uh, female entrepreneurs across Asia, whether it's um, India or other, other parts of Asia? Mm. Yeah, so I think that's probably uh, Andrea could answer the best with the global scope of our charitable giving activities in Asia. What I can talk about, you know, the foundation support in Sub-Saharan Africa, um, where of course continue to um, underline this importance of supporting female entrepreneurs. And um, like uh, Francois said, it's an intentional um, effort, but we think it's also very important first step to, to raise awareness. And then you can um, even raise awareness of policy makers uh, and then uh, to try to direct uh, some of the governmental funding sources also more towards female entrepreneurs um, and I think just the the anecdotal um, stories coming from all these female entrepreneurs are super inspiring um, publicly uh, our awards um, picked up a lot of uh, medium attention um, earlier this year, I think also because of, of, of this aspect. You know, when we received 400 applications, it's like 400 life stories behind it. We asked the, the applicants, you know, why, what motivated you to start off uh, with your social enterprise? And we have like pages, pages of answers. And it's really touching uh, to read them. Uh, some of them saying, okay, they renamed their enterprise after their grandmothers because that strong female was a role model who sustained the whole family over different crises and with their wisdom, creativity and hard work. And some of them, you know, mentioned the, the difficult challenges uh, when during their young adulthood, um, seeing their families and friends, you know, lacking access to health, lacking access to nutrition. Um, and, and all these, I think, are um, quite enlightening and, and, and also pointing out to which uh, content area we should um, focus and, and with that inspiring story. I remember 
uh, one lady who didn't get to the next round but still wrote us uh, because she thought the finalist stories were so inspiring and she she uh, deliberately wrote us saying you know just by seeing someone who's trying so hard to achieve something this is already a milestone for her no matter if she gets into the program or not and she would continue the, the, the path that she's been doing and, and trying even harder to get to the next awards i mean this is just uh, very touching i think as the as a female myself and then you know i, I think uh, the the public uh, power of this um, inspiration uh, is already um, um, of so much value yeah that is such a such a lovely thought that sort of 300 400 stories um maybe you need to publish a book too maybe we can have that next year we yeah we're digging out data maybe <laughs> Yeah, we're digging out data from this uh, application. Maybe we get back to Francois and look at the systems work behind it. Yes. Um, Abby, I wanted to uh, bring you in again as, as the uh, entrepreneur on panel. How do we better support? How do we improve the support for female entrepreneurs? Oh, wow. Well, there's so many ways. You know, female entrepreneurs, yes, we are super, but we need help. We need strong men and women to work with us. And one of the great things that I love about the, um, you know, the, the fact that we won the Bayer Women Empowerment Fund is that Bayer is training all of my management team. We're all growing in capacity. More females need this type of support, where it's not just the entrepreneur that is building capacity, but also others within the organization. Another thing that we need is access. We need access to resources. Where can you get this you know, approval? Where can you get that? that? Being able to refer to a compendium or some database helps. But you know, I know that differs from sector to sector and it also differs from country to country. But just empowering and enabling one to know where to search resources is beautiful. A third is you know, more like validation. So many women haven't quite built up their networks. They've not joined the boys club. They haven't quite, you know, networked in a manner that they are with, you know, the top echelon of society. But being validated by strong companies, high, re good reputation is really important to thrive. And being showcased in, you know, interviews, being showcased in, you know, um, case studies really helps. Um, women also need as much as possible funding to enable some of their point of view and MVPs to be tested. So it helps you to actually do, you know, a minor pilot that helps you to then see whether your ideas are valid or not, and you can then go back to the drawing board. So seed funding is essential. And I think that's essential all across, but women need it more because of the way we access funding. So many times you find that men are giving more chances to access funding than women. In some societies, you actually have to bring a husband before you can access some loans. That doesn't all go well with some of us, you know. So being able to find seed funding is excellent. It's a good way to, you know, to empower women entrepreneurs. So it's capacity and capacity building. It's support with resources. It's, you know, being validated and showcased and also accessing funding. Wonderful. I think that's like a really good sort of top 10 list. Uh, <laughs> and I think all of us, all, I think most women have been um, at a conference or in a meeting or in a room somewhere, you felt like you were completely uh, sort of in a minority. And um, I was mentioning earlier before the panel started that last the last time Sankalp had um, its conference in real life, um, there was a session in the evening, which was all female session uh, with just a lot of female investors, entrepreneurs and thought leaders and others. And it was a really empowering room to be in. And a, in a space that is otherwise quite um, male dominated, um, the startup space, whether social or not, it was uh, fantastic to just be in a female uh, dominated space. Um, I wanted to, I have a, another a big sort of question to ask that I wanted to ask all of you. Uh, but before that, I should also, also mention that I believe we have a few minutes for questions. So if anyone has any questions, if you could uh, message, send a chat message and then we will try to ask this panel those questions. Um, so the last question I have is, 
um, given that we're all global and also work locally, um, when we're talking about, you know, coming back to supporting innovation and entrepreneurship for uh, nutrition and health, especially with a gender focus, what do we do globally? What, what can we use our global networks for, our gl uh, global fora? Uh, and what needs to happen at the very local level? I know we talked a little bit about systems in between, but, you know, what, what, do we, what can we use the global networks for and what do we need to do much more locally? Um, who do I start with? Maybe I'll start with Francois again. Um, yeah, I was hoping you'd start with someone else. Uh, my, my initial thought was it's like the connection between the two. So I think what we can do at global level is, you know, sometimes I, I, I worry, I mean, I, and I sit in a global institution, what impact are we really having locally? And I think it's important we ask these questions. Um, but we do have a normative function, we have a legitimizing function, we have a steering function, uh, and obviously resources when there are resources to be able to use that, but how do we not, so how do we use the normative function well that enables the local uh, uh, to be able to, so I mean, I'm using academic language. So, so one example is WHO, right? So um, we know that local social entrepreneurs sometimes can't get to speak to their kind of local hospital, local minister, even national minister. And WHO's function is to kind of, and so we built a social innovation and health initiative to actually, for the main reason, to allow African ministers of health, Latin American ministers of health, uh, European ministers of health to recognize if WHO says actually social entrepreneurs are important and should be part of a health system and your design, maybe locally they'll start thinking about that and engaging locally. So, so while WHO is not going to do it itself, it can help to set the tone and the scene and the legitimacy for that kind of work. And so that, but where the action really happens has got to be local. So I think it's, you know, thinking about where each of us are in our institutions, how do we help, but really the local is where it needs to, to play out. And obviously then when, when there are resources to, to determine, we all know this kind of inverted pyramid of you know, by the time the money really gets down to the local level, very little is actually there. So how do we think carefully about who are the local actors that should be participating and how resources get distributed, how things are designed? I'll just leave it at that. I'm sure others have good ideas. Thank you. I wanted to turn to uh, Pang and, and Andrea now. How do you think global versus local, uh, whether it's global versus local partnerships or is it global versus local action? Maybe, maybe I can contribute a little bit. I think we're in a, as a corporation which is present and active in more than 80 countries, I think we have, we're in a quite nice position to um, trigger a lot of support coming from the country. So uh, as biocorporate uh, giving and social innovation functions now, we um, trigger, we allow the countries really to choose what is relevant on the ground and which are the organizations and the entrepreneurs that really are making a difference and we encourage them to provide support. So in this shift from the classical traditional support to the innovation support, we really encourage our country. So we have a local person in each country looking for the, the valuable projects and selecting what are the main causes that uh, need support. So I think we're in a nice position in that sense. And I think the good news is also that following the steps of the foundation, the corporate side of buyer is also entering very, um, I would say with a very bold presence in social innovation awards, meaning that uh, the applications that we will be receiving next year are not coming only with the, with the focus in Africa as the foundation has a clear focus on sub-Saharan Africa, we would be looking into the globe. So any entrepreneur from any part of the world, which is sitting in a low and mid-income country could seek for us our support as from next year, which is very good news. Um, but also then on the countries, in the countries, the local um, representatives of buyer are willing to learn about those ideas. So this is a little part of the ecosystem, but I think it's already a spark that can help and integrate. We know the governments, we are relating to many uh, stakeholders in the healthcare area. So I think we can also expose those entrepreneurs to a great network to, to help amplify their work. Thank you. I think another thing maybe we can think about this is inclusiveness, right? So from global and local perspective and being inclusive um, not only means being able to provide the, the care to the majority of the, of the, of the target group, uh, in our case, the local communities, but also being affordable, meaning that the solution is to be either reducing the costs or being more cost effective compared to existing solutions. And uh, not only this, uh, this part, but also the 
inclusiveness uh, needs to through co-creation. So you need to consider really like uh, all the partners are potential uh, innovators as well. You need to be including them into this co-creation journey. Let it be local, let it be global in government, in business, in academia, in healthcare system or, or the society at large. I think we just need to be more inclusive in driving this forwards. Yeah. Thank you. Um, Abby, I'd love to hear from you, especially since you have, you know, previously worked in, in philanthropy and I'm, I'm guessing at a more of a macro level and now uh, as a startup, it's uh, significantly more micro level. Um, what's your take on local versus global here in, in uh, action for gendered, uh, better access for nutrition and health with women? Sorry, can you repeat the question? Um, in terms of um, in terms of uh, you know in terms of um, gender nutrition and health, where do we stand in local action versus global action? Where do we um, where do we balance? What you know? Where do we focus? Do we go for global? What can global actors and global networks do, and what can uh, local actors do? Um, my my view is, I mean, these are early thoughts, but I think that we can all work together. I am a champion for collaboration any day. And I think the local context has to come into play when you even bring in global perspectives. Um, things differ from country to country and even segments to segment. So there is no gain saying that we must involve local players, even when we bring international solutions. I've always wanted a situation where countries can, you know, be self-sufficient, but you know, where you need to bring aid and support, let it be as inclusive as possible, include the local perspectives, and then let it be such that, you know, we, we help to build systems that you can move away from and they run rather than interventions all of the time. But these are early thoughts of mine. Wonderful. So thank you. Back to this sort of focus on systems as opposed to uh, more narrow focus on support. Um, we have one question here. I'm not sure if uh, anyone in the panel is, is comfortable taking it. Um, it's around what are we seeing um, new alternative food systems uh, to enable better nutrition. I know this is not a health panel or a scientific panel, but if anyone's willing to take that question, I'm happy to open it up. I think we may not. Um, so I think we're about to wrap up here. Um, let's do one last quick round from everyone and hear, um, you know, where do you see, you know, in the next three to five years, what are you hoping to see in terms of, um, you know, better support for social innovation and entrepreneurship in this space, um, especially in, in regards to gender and nutrition and health? What are you hoping to see in the next three to five years? So what are you hopeful for in the next three to five years? Um, let's start with Abby and then Andrea and then Fong and then last Francois. Abby, you're on mute. I'm so I'm struggling with network. Forgive me. Not a problem. Forgive me. So I missed I missed that as well. well what are you excited about in terms of um, you know gender, um, you know innovation and, and entrepreneurship, gender and nutrition over the next three to five years? What are you hoping for, or what mm -hmm. are you excited about? Well, I'm looking forward to many more women-driven programs because then you would see beyond the numbers you'd see us building sustainability into many of the inter, you know, programs and initiatives. I'm looking forward to involving more communities and broader perspectives. And I just can't wait for you know, um, programs that can be sustained beyond the, you know, the founders. That to me would be a great success. Wonderful, thank you. Uh, quickly on to Andrea and then Pong. Thank you, Lina. I'm, I'm, I was thinking here, I think what I'm really looking forward to is to the moment in which we are not having specific women uh, 
uh, initiatives, but really selecting the projects because we trust that the women are the ones that can really take that initiative um, forward, you know. I am I'm just thinking of an example. I'm Brazilian, and um, in my country, the loans for real estate, they are only giving for the real uh, underserved communities. They are only given to women. They are the ones to sign the contract because the pay, the repayment rates are so much higher when a woman is committed. And I think that shows what women are standing for in terms of resilience, of commitment, of you know engagement, because they're, they're, they're already handling so much. And when you say, someone is engaged with a new idea and wanting to make a change, and this person is a woman. Uh, I think the chances of, of getting forward with this idea and being successful are very high. So I'm looking forward to the moment in which we have uh, you know, funds being given and then you, you really choose um, an entrepreneur based on knowing how much they can achieve and most likely women will have more chances, not because of necessarily an intention there, but because this is just a fact that has been recognized. Thank you. Ante Pong and then Francois. Yeah, I think beyond the female entrepreneurship in, in social innovation, uh, I would also like to see how we can really build a more resilient um, healthcare system after the pandemic, um, uh, uniting all our efforts. I think this inclusive health aspect is something the Bayer Foundation really want to focus in the next uh, three, five years um, and trying to you know, find um, effective ways or, or successful models that can can make this happen through systems work, through different um, um, uh, single project. So um, what we're looking forward is, is something um, yeah, coming up soon um, in the next uh, three, five years. Thank you. Uh, on to Francois. Yeah, I'm going to build on what Pong's saying. I, I, I agree with her entirely. I think this moment has given us an opportunity to really focus on, on health systems. Uh, and I wanted to come back to actually, I think what, what you said at the beginning, you know, the, the, the connection between science and social innovation isn't only social innovation. It's the fact that we need both technological process progress, but we also need societal progress. And, you know, I mean, Mothers to Mothers showed that, I, you know, you know, with all the great kind of academic knowledge, we were clearly kind of not winning with the, the, the transmission of HIV. And I think we learned a lot about how the societal components is as important as you know for, for our progress and to actually make even the the, the 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 even to get the biological outcomes we need societal progress so 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 the, the this this you know the, the, the that that connection between our technological process progress along with our kind of civilization our societal progress around how we organize and that's what entrepreneurs do they help us rethink about how we organize uh, and I think that's, you know, an exciting time for the next couple of years. And, you know, it's it's clear uh, we need to continue to be intentional about the, the, the role of women in that, because I think that, that you know, there, there, there's, we're missing out so much by not having them uh, as much more active part of those ecosystems. Thanks. Wonderful. Thank you so much to this wonderful panel. Thank you to Andrea, Abby, Pong and Francois. Um, it's been fabulous um, moderating this panel, but I am now handing over to Sarita for the final part of this session. Thank you. Sarita, you're on mute. Thank you. Thank you so much. I was unmuted by the host, so I'm back. Uh, what a fascinating conversation and discussion, and I think the focus on women is rightly so needed. But I would like to move now, uh, you know, first of all, thank you everybody. And now we move to, you know, I want you to join and listen to us, how we are shifting for women in healthcare to women in agriculture. You know, almost 80% of uh, Indian population lives in its villages and agriculture is the number one activity, economic activity that we have. And I think we need to talk also about our smallholder women farmers, how are they getting impacted and what can we do to bring in the entrepreneurial mindset within these women? Uh, you know, uh, let me ask, uh, uh, you know, so joining me on this panel is uh, Dr. Raman Bujral. He's from Entrepreneurship Development Institute for India, he oversees the corporate projects and also is the regional director based out of Bangalore. EDII is an acknowledged National Resource Institute for Entrepreneurship Education, Research, Training, and Institution Building. Uh, welcome, Raman. 
you know, as I was listening to this panel, uh, you know, a question comes to me and I have the audience in front of me. If just for a quick minute, you could close your eyes and picture a farmer and write down on the chat, what's that image that comes to you? Come on, let's see what comes up. I would be very, very keen to uh, see, you know, what's coming up if you close your eyes and think of a farmer. Anybody? Anybody who's willing to write in the chat what they see? I think we have a shy audience out over here. Uh, but I, I can but bet, you know, for most of them, it's the men farmer, the male farmer that they are seeing, and the woman is nowhere in the picture. She continues to be faceless and invisible. You know, yet on the other side, last week I was reading this very fascinating study report of uh, two young IIT women engineers who started their own venture on online cattle and uh, selling and are very successful. I mean, the disparity cannot be far more glaring than this. And I think that's why we need to bring in the voice of women and work with them towards development and growth. You know, my foundation in India has been working with smallholder farmers across the country uh, and equipping them with skills and knowledge to uplift them and accelerate rural development. In 2020 alone, we reached out to almost 0 0.2 million smallholder farmers in over 15 states and 200 plus districts. 40% of the smallholder farmers were women, but we had to work hard to bring them in. You know? Being in visible, faceless does not mean that women do not play a critical role in agriculture. I remember a 2013 Oxfam report, you know, where they say, it said that 80% of the farm work is undertaken by women in India. But only 13% of these women own the land. And then there was a study by the National Council of Applied Economic Research where it stated that women constitute over 42% of the agricultural labor force in India, but own less than 2% of farm work. I think it's not surprising then that we don't see the recognition of women, you know, and when it comes to land rights or when it comes to giving them subsidies or even having them gain access to what the government uh, provides, like institutional credit, pension, irrigation subsidies, and et cetera. 83% of the agriculture land in the country in his own country. I think that's the reality that we have a grim situation, a harsh reality. So how do we really then, you know, upskill women farmers? How do we really uh, bring in the entrepreneurship skill set to these farmers? And I turn over to my co-host Raman to give me a context and an overview, and maybe some examples on how women farmers can be entrepreneurs. Raman, over to you. Sarita, uh, you have nicely captured the whole scenario. And uh, you know that when you're talking about uh, women um, or uh, this particular gender, so that we are almost talking about the half of the population of the globe, almost. So what I'm saying that um, when we are talking about women farmers and you're talking about 40% plus, but I can say that even in the rural society, they are playing many roles, uh, whether it is a family, rural, social environment, but they are, part of the economic development. So I think that we should address uh, women farmers uh, uh, very sensitively, and we should, we should bring them uh, the entrepreneurial spirit among them. And once we bring the entrepreneurial spirit, I think uh, we can address the one is the managerial need uh, to run their business uh, as a profitable farm business. And the second is the entrepreneurial spirit. That is more important. And what EDI has done, EDI has inculcated both uh, entrepreneurial spirit also and managerial spirit also. And based on that, today many of the women farm uh, owned uh, entrepreneur are leading their uh, farm businesses in, in southern part of the uh, India and uh, eastern part of the India and uh, uh, southern provinces in Maharashtra of India. So I have many examples, but uh, I would like to say that uh, we should think upon uh, women uh, as a farmer, not only a farmer, but she should become a business farmer women. So what about uh, your take on this, Sarita? Like, uh, do you agree with me? Like <laughs> that uh, we, should, we should convert these women uh, as a farmer to entrepreneur. 
you know, I'm, I've always been passionate, you know, that we must move farmers from being producers to being marketeers. I think that time has come and more so with women. Uh, so, uh, you know, I, I would like to give an example. Last year, we started a, a project in one of these aspirational districts in Maharashtra. And the whole idea was how do we improve the socioeconomic status of rural women over there. And we took a two-pronged approach that we need to have financial and digital literacy go hand in hand with livelihood diversification. And the reason for uh, that is, you know, there's always a time lag between one season to another. What do we do then? I think that's a perfect time to sort of capture the attention of the women smallholder farmers and train them and equip them with some different skill sets. Uh, you know, I like to share a story of uh, Sunita Nayak, who's a member of a self-help group in that one of the villages. She's a landless farmer, a widow, and she has absolutely no source of income other than farm labor. Now, can you imagine sustaining a family around the whole year with just no other source of income but this, you know? Today, in, in rupees per month. Now, how did this happen? So, you know, through the project that we put in, we first, of course, did the need assessment, and then we did the, you know, reorganization of the self-help groups according to their grading and what were they really into. And then we looked at four enterprises on goat rearing, covering three villages and 40 women members from self-help groups. You know, for our scaling uh, of the project interventions, you know, we took help from NABAR, and we're really grateful for their support for the skill development that came in. Uh, we did training events on poultry and poultry and covered almost 90 women uh, across different groups. You know. Now, also, we, we went a step beyond. It's not just looking at the three. I think we are looking at a whole ecosystem approach, but then we looked into the healthcare. So any woman out there who was pregnant or who had a child under zero to 12 months, uh, you know, we brought them into prenatal care and all of that. And this, for this, we are looking at at least six villages to bring up enterprise, uh, like a home, still vegetable cultivation and rice mill and spice blending machine. So as you see, a number of multiple things, we didn't stick with one narrow approach, but it really, really broadened our um, horizon to see what can we really give women, you know, and give them an opportunity. Now, so today, with all the support, Sunita has got five female and one male goat. And she's already underwent uh, 10 days training programs on managing goat enterprise. Now, she has a potential of you know, 50,000 from goat enterprise, and through reproduction, she will earn like six to 7,000 per month from second year onwards by means of selling the goat. Now, this is one success story, Raman. But honestly, at the ground, there may be some challenges. There's always that, you know, uh, changing behavioral patterns, changing mindsets, especially with women farmers who've never been on the forefront, takes a long haul. Uh, you know, so maybe I turn with some of these challenges and what has been uh, the EDII experience uh, and what kind of solutions do you think we can look at over here? Yes, Sarita, the challenges are always there because when uh, when we want to transform these women farmers into as an entrepreneur, but we transform them, then they start seeing their farms as a business. And then they see their farms as a means of earning profits versus labor. So now they are looking for profits out of their uh, produce. And then they are very passionate about their farm businesses and uh, they are willing to take calculate risk to make their farms profitable or make uh, businesses to grow. So what I'm saying, it should be a greenpreneurship kind of concept which we have created. Uh, the challenges that you are talking about, see the initially it is very difficult to uh, convince um, uh, women farmers uh, that you can become an entrepreneur while doing uh, farming also, because they think that farming means uh, their job is up to uh, the harvesting. But what is the post-harvest? So EDI took it as a very nice uh, product line. And that is, you know, that uh, Moringa uh, is a drumstick uh, uh, kind of uh, uh, crop. Uh, and we call it Moringacea or Moringa olisifera. But I'll tell you that this is uh, the kind of a product which has a very high 
uh, nutrition value. And when we are talking today about uh, health and hunger, there this health also comes. So what the farmer women are producing, it should be healthy also. It should be uh, sustainable also, and it should be acceptable produced by globally. So this particular crop is very um, having high rich proteins, vitamins, minerals, and it can fight malnutrition also. So when we uh, promoted this kind of cultivation, and then we uh, demonstrated the kind of 22 value added product products out of that particular uh, crop, the leaves can be converted into powder, moringa tea, chocolates, energy bar, juices, capsules, animal feed, facial cream, etc. So all this convincing was a very difficult because they haven't thought that this particular leaf can be converted into so many items. But slowly, slowly, we provided technology, we skilled them, we provided all kinds of inputs, compliances, and today more than 1,000 plus women-owned farmers producer organization a team is working uh, in and around uh, Kanya Kumari and they are doing a lot of business out of this and they are exporting the produce uh, from this. So these are the challenges plus success stories. So once there is a challenge, then definitely demonstration effects work very nicely. So now other women are also joining this movement and there are so many other stories of coconut or minor forest produce. I can, you pick a product, it has a lot of value, it can give, only we need to make them women entrepreneur, women farmer entrepreneur. Definitely they can change the world. So this is from my side, Sarita, and uh, what do you think about this? You know, I'm so fascinated by this story. I hope someday I could meet these women. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Ye
and they should reach up to the maturity level, then only these corporates and big companies will approach them and then these women will be on their own. So my uh, take from EDII is that, that we should be with these women agripreneurs for at least two years, then only they can be at the maturity level. So this I wanted to tell you uh, and to all the audience and those who are watching this. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you Ramon, so much. And thank you for joining me in this session. Over to Sankal. Uh, as we end this session. Just a quick thank you to everybody for joining us and thank you to the Bayer Foundation and all the speakers and Nina for moderating. Uh, we really enjoyed having you here today and uh, we hope we can take forward all of these conversations uh, to action. Uh, please join us for the rest of the summit too.